Now does it? Islam doesn't win by default. I came here to debate Islam. If you want to debate Old Testament atrocities, I accept your challenge for a debate. Let's do it when the time and setting is right. No, um, no the reason why you don't want to debate the Bible is the same reason of what we see you on the internet. You are running scared because you cannot answer those three questions. He said, oh, okay, I'll do a bit later. Let's do it right now. This is not the reason why. It's because you know that if you look at the Bible, it clearly confirms genocide and terrorism. And you are just running. And that's why you've been running all night in this debate. And, the reason why, and it wasn't the two-quo fallacy. I said Islam came to correct the genocide and terrorism of biblical Christianity. I'm making that comparison, Sam Shimon. So what's up? You want to do this right now? Huh, Sam? You want to debate it? You want to do it? What's up, man? You said, oh, no, we'll do it later. Right there, right there, Let's doing, do it now, no, dear, man. You're doing your closing statement. Okay, right well, he's running again. You're using up he's your time. saying, no, he doesn't want to debate it now. All right, you can keep running from me, but I'm going to chase after you. He'll choose to debate you with okay. his own words, all right, not all words right. you're trying to that's, put in your mouth. Cool, Just make your cool. closing statement. All right, statement. let me go on. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pastor Jim Sweeney, and on behalf of Arabic Christian Perspective, I would like to welcome you to today's debate. Arabic Christian Perspective is a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing the gospel with Muslims living in America. This is called the Great Debate Series, and it is designed to give both Christians and Muslims a chance to present and defend their positions on various Islamic and Christian topics. Rather than simply agree to disagree or even to make concessions or compromises to our own faith, it is, as is sometimes practiced if you are in an interfaith dialogue, the method with the, this debate, it puts each other's belief system under rigorous scrutiny. Opening statements cannot be taken at face value. There will be rebuttals and cross-examinations and audience questioning, and so every neatly constructed case will be tested to prove its validity. We at ACP and all those who participate with us prefer that arguments be thoroughly tested by critical examination. Commonly, in interfaith dialogue, cases for or against a particular topic is accepted at face value. In our terms and conditions for interacting with Muslims, we clearly state, Arabic Christian perspective has a love for all Muslims. We disagree with the teachings of Islam, but we love the Muslim people and we want them to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so we appreciate you for joining us in this debate. The question before us this evening is, is Christianity a religion of peace? Supporting the affirmative's position will be Professor Daniel Scott. And in the negative position is going to be Nadir Ahmed. Daniel Scott was born and raised in Pakistan. He was educated there and he earned a Master's of Science in Mathematics as well as a degree from a Pakistani seminary. As a mathematics lecturer in Pakistan, Daniel Scott was tested on his knowledge of Islam before holding his post. He scored 100% in his knowledge of Islam, holding the first position in all Pakistan at that time. He has been discussing religion with Muslims since 1966. He was acquitted in Australia recently, and many of you are familiar, there was a court case there. Uh, Muslims claimed that he had vilified their religion. The Supreme Court in Australia found no proof that he was misrepresenting anything in the Quran or Hadith. And so, defending the opposition's position about is Christianity a religion of peace is apologist, Muslim apologist, Nadir Ahmed. Nadir is the webmaster of the Islamic debate website called examinethetruth.com. He has been recommended by the Islamic Center of Peoria. His debates have been viewed by hundreds of thousands throughout the Muslim world. Now let us proceed and uh, we'll give you the rules for the debate.
First off, both speakers will have an opening statement of 25 minutes apiece. And then there will be a first round of rebuttals of 10 minutes per person. There will be a second round of rebuttals of 10 minutes. And then there will be a cross-examination where one of the speakers will ask questions of the other speaker to defend their position. So two rounds of cross-examination and then a five-minute conclusion by each of the speakers. And then there will be time for questions from the audience. So the uh, first person who is going to be speaking tonight in the affirmative is Christianity, a religion of peace, is Daniel Scott. This tonight debate is Christianity religion of peace. I can 100% say with my total belief that Christianity is a religion of peace. Peace with whom? Peace with whom? Peace with other nations? The church, like Israel and Islam, is not a political entity. It will not be a political entity until Jesus returns. This may be confusing to non-Christian, especially Muslim people, because they were states aligned with churches in the past. But this is not the biblical model. Peace with man. Christianity does not promise that our fellow men will like us to be nice uh, or will be nice to us. Jesus promised tribulation and persecution because worldly people hate true religions. True, true righteous people. Sorry. Tribulation and persecution, Jesus said you will suffer. Why? Because worldly people hate the truth and righteousness. Even from family members, Jesus said he didn't come to bring peace among family members, but that people's enemy would be of their own house. People will kill you and think they are doing God a favor. For example, think of if you are a Muslim and uh, you want to become a Christian, what will your family member do to you? if they practice the Qur'an. As we have already seen in Qur'an, Allah does command that people should kill those who renegade or those who turn away from Islam. So this type of persecution Jesus knew will happen and as we know it's already happening. So man's greatest need is peace with God. So we have all sinned according to the Bible and broken God's laws so we have fallen short of glory of God. So that there, need, there is a need of peace between God and man. The work of the law, that is guilt, is written on our hearts. So whenever we do something wrong, we acknowledge in our own heart that we are doing wrong. But with time, conscious is muddled up and people think what they are doing wrong is right. The Holy Spirit of God convicts men of sin, of righteousness, of God and judgment to come. So there is a need of peace between God and man. Consider Ten Commandments. Now you may not have broken all the Ten Commandments, but Ten Commandments are like chain. If you break one, you have broken the whole. Can anybody claim to be perfect? Or never broken any of the commandment. So there's a gap, there's an enmity between God and man. Peace with God is a universal need of every human being, which is felt throughout the human history since the fall or disobedience of Adam and Eve. God of the Bible, being a righteous judge, punishes sin. The punishment is eternal separation from the Holy God. The broken relationship between God and human being cannot be restored by human efforts. There is no bridge which we can build to reach God. The word of God declares none can by any means redeem his brother, nor 
give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their soul is costly, and it shall cease forever, that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. So what we learn here, that the ransom which has to be paid for us to be redeemed and to be reconciled to God, to have peace with God, there is nobody who can pay that redemption. It is too costly. Someone may say, good works can bring reconciliation. But the word of God teaches us, we read in Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6, our righteousness, our righteous deeds are like filthy rags in the sight of God. So, this war, this enmity between God and man cannot be breached by man himself. Hence, the best human effort remains finite and will fail to reach God. But God being the Almighty can reach us if He chooses to reconcile and restore peace within us. In His grace and mercy, He revealed to the Old Testament saints that He is the Redeemer and He will redeem them. So this enmity between God and man was to be reconciled by the Redeemer Himself, Lord Jesus Christ. So anybody on whom death is pronounced, the person can be redeemed by ransom. As we learn from the Bible, the same is taught in Islamic religious book as well. A very common familiar story of Abraham, who offered his son and he was to kill his son, but God provided a ransom. And uh, that spared the life of Abraham's son. We read that in Genesis chapter 22, verse 9 to 13, and also in Quran 37, Surah 37, verse 107. God revealed the truth of ransom in ancient ages. Job, probably the Job, book of Job is one of the ancient, if not the oldest book in the Bible, who, lives, who lived thousands of years before Jesus was born. He knew that his Redeemer will pay ransom for him and he will see him, he will see his Redeemer face to face. We read that in Job 19.25-26. So though in the atmosphere of no hope, in the atmosphere where there was no scope for a mankind to have peace with God, God is promised Redeemer. Peace with God is universal need of every human being, as I stated earlier. How and why the true peace can be found in Lord Jesus Christ only? How can I justify myself that anyone who does not accept Jesus as Lord and Savior cannot have peace with God and peace with fellow human being in its true sense? Many may question my blank statement that the true peace with God is in Christ alone. What about other religions? They also teach to achieve peace with God. I'm glad you raised this question. Because our two-day discussion is about Christianity and Islam, so I will briefly mention concerning only two other major religions that's Hinduism and Buddhism. In Hinduism, they can never be sure what life their karma will bring next to them. In Buddhism, their founder Buddha believed there is no God, hence peace with God is out of question. When Buddha was dying, he was asked, what will happen after this life? And he responded, don't ask me, I know, I see only darkness. So in those great religions, which is a, a large population, they didn't have concept of peace with God and there's no peace with God. However, in Islam, there are various theories or ways to have peace with Allah, which includes the following. We read in Quran many, many times. I've listed a few ref references, Surah 2, verse 284, Surah 3, verse 74, and uh, verse 129, Surah 5, verse 18, in verse 40, Surah 29, 21, and so on. So it says that if Allah wills, He will forgive you, and if He wills, He will punish you. So if this is will of Allah. If He want to forgive, He will forgive, otherwise He will punish you. 
Then there's another theory in Quran we read uh, that if your good deeds are heavier than your bad deeds, you will enter into paradise. That's in Surah 7 verse 8, Surah 7 verse 23, uh, Surah 23 verse 102 and so on. There are other references there. Then there's another option, theory in Quran, which uh, gives a hope of salvation. If you fight for Allah, kill or be killed, you will enter paradise. So that's in Quran and Hadith, many references there. I've only listed a few. If you are interested, I think there are some copies where, which have written Jihad and Islam. I've listed uh, hundreds of verses where Allah teaches uh, about killing in, in the Quran and fighting and looting and so on. Some Muslim can say, here you see there is a salvation in Islam as well. Wait a minute. Let us see what do the founder and other prominent leaders of Islam has to say in this regard. So we have already seen a bit about that, that uh, Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, he was terrified that he will be cast into hellfire. We read in Bukhari volume 2 and hadith number 454, hadith number 458, hadith 459 and so on. He did not know what will Allah do with him on the day of judgment. We read in Bukhari volume 2, hadith number 2, uh, 334. He was terrified if there was an eclipse or a strong wind. We read in Bukhari volume 2 and so on. He was terrified that he was demon possessed. We have already discussed that. Uh, so, although he was promised in in hadith that he will go to paradise. But he has no assurance. Why? Because he has not accepted Jesus as a Lord and Savior. And there is no other way to have peace with God unless you come to accept that truth. Abu Bakr Siddiq, the next most important man in Islamic, he says, although he was, uh, he was very faithful and he was promised again in uh, paradise, and uh, he says, with tear in his eyes that uh, would that I have been a bitten tree whenever he was reminded of his position in Allah's sight he would say by Allah I would not feel safe from Allah's punishment now the Arabic there is uh, makar which means deceit so we read about Umar also it was it's the same thing he has no shown of salvation he was crying weeping because why is that it's very easy because they have rejected Jesus as their Lord and Savior and they cannot have peace with God. There is no guarantee to anybody. Conclusion from the tradition, Muhammad repeatedly asked to have his sins forgiven. He was afraid of the Day of Judgment, did not know what will Allah do to him, was afraid whenever there was an eclipse. He tried to commit suicide hoping to find peace. Abu Bakr promised paradise by Allah and Muhammad, still he was terrified that, that he can be cast into hellfire, and so on the other. We read in the Bible that only Jesus can fulfill our need of peace with God. There's a famous saying, there's a God-like vacuum in every heart, which can only be filled by God, Him alone. Not by human effort, not by what we can do, but by God alone. And we read in John's Gospel chapter 3 verse 36 He that believes on the Son hath everlasting life and he that believes not the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abides on him. We also know very well Jesus said John's Gospel chapter 14 verse 6 I am the way, the truth and the life. Nobody can come to the Father except through me. And then we read in the next passage, I will not read the whole passage for you, where Jesus said that Satan, thief, comes to steal, kill and destroy, but I have come to give life and life more abundant. So if anybody wants to have peace with God, he needs to accept Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, as his Lord and Savior. There is no other way to be saved. And here we see in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 to 22, again I will not read, I'm conscious of my time. So here we see that we are reconciled to God because Jesus has paid the price. He died on the cross and that's what actually has reconciled us. And this peace which Jesus gives to his disciple, to his follower, that cannot be snatched away from them. 
We read in uh, Romans chapter 8, I will just read a few verses toward the end. In Christ that died, yeah, rather, that was risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conqueror through him that loves us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. So this is the peace which Christ can only offer. And there is no other religion which can offer you such peace but only Christ. So that uh, you love him. And uh, you know that this peace which Jesus gives, we read in John's Gospel chapter 14 verse 27, it says, Not as the word gives, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the word gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So this is the peace which is available to everybody. And uh, uh, anybody who accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior, he can have that peace which surpasses all understanding. And then we can read other verses. Uh, so, so our hope, our confidence of this eternal peace is not based on human being, is not based on ourselves, is anchored in the character of God. The God of the Bible is not God of the Quran. So the character of the God of Bible has to be explained. For clarity's sake, it will be contrasted with the God of Islam. The God of the Bible is true God. We read in Bible that God of the Bible cannot lie. The God of the Bible does not change. The God of the Bible cannot lie. We read in Numbers chapter 23 verse 19, Hebrews 6, 18, Titus 1, 2, and there are many other references where God makes very clear He cannot lie because He is the truth. And that's why we Christians have 100% assurance because we believe in God who is the truth. What does Quran tell about Allah? We have already discussed it to fair length that there are various translations of Surah 3 verse 54. Some say that Allah is schemer, others say Allah is plotter. But one translation by uh, Muhammad Ahmed and Samir Ahmed, that translation says, and they cheated, deceived, and Allah, God cheated, deceived, and God is the best of all the cheaters, deceiver. So, the Arabic, I think I will skip that, we have already discussed that, I want to cover a bit more. So in, in light of that, finding peace with God, before you, there are two books, the Bible and the Quran. So if somebody has to find the real peace, we need to look at both the books. One is written by someone who boasts of being the greatest of all deceivers. The other is written by one who cannot lie. Before you are two religious leaders. One tried to commit suicide to find peace, fearing demon possession, was terrified of eclipse, and did not know what his God will do with him on the day of judgment. The other lived a sinless life, performed miracle, healed all the sick, and did wonderful thing, ascended into heaven, promised to secure forgiveness and heaven for all who trust in him, before you are the lives of their follower. The closest follower of one we have already seen, of Muhammad's closest follower was Abu Bakr, who wept when he remembered what will happen to him and his other follower as well. True God is the righteous judge. He gives and he takes life. Whenever and whatever ways he likes, none can question the sovereign Lord. He is just to punish those who sin. It is his sovereign right. No one can question it. And please remember that when we commit any sin according Bible, all sin is against God. 
If I steal from you, I'm not just stealing from you, I'm sinning against God of the Bible. Because the Bible makes it very clear that all sin is against God. When you offend somebody who is the highest authority, the punishment for that same action is very high as well. So when you are offending the Most High God, Sovereign Lord, then the punishment, the ransom, can never be repaid by any means. We read that in Quran as well as in, in Bible, and nobody can pay the ransom. So when we have separated from God, the only way to be reconciled back to God was through Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we know that God, because He's just God, He does punish his sin. And in that punishment, He destroyed the whole human race. We know the story of flood of Noah in Genesis. There were only eight people left alive. Everybody else was, including women, children, and everybody was destroyed, killed. We also see in Sodom and Gomorrah, those two towns, they were destroyed. Everybody got destroyed. Only Lot and his family was left. And there are many other incidents where God did punish. And uh, because he is the sovereign Lord, he gives life and he takes life, so nobody can question him. But God, Lord Jesus Christ, when he became man, he told us to, to love and to care, which we will see in uh, next uh, time. I think my time is cutting close. So, so we, what we need to see, that when we have peace with God, that's the first thing to have peace. And if somebody does not have peace in his own life, he cannot give peace to anybody else. Lord Jesus Christ, he is the Prince of Peace, and we see he has, we read in Matthew's Gospel, that uh, the Father said, he is my beloved son, I am well pleased with him. So, because he has peace with God, he can give us peace. And we have that peace. And when we have that peace, we share that peace with other human beings, which I will be discussing in the next 10 minutes when I have time to more talk on that. So the foundation of peace is only found in Christianity. Why? Because Lord Jesus Christ is the only Prince of Peace, and he brought peace. We know in Scripture, we read in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 17, that uh, Moses brought the law, but Jesus Christ brought grace and truth. So this is a progression. In, in Old Testament, we see that when God punished people, there was many devastation. But that was the progression from there. When final came, Lord Jesus Christ came. Uh, he has brought grace and truth. So I can confidently tell and say that you can have peace with God through Lord Jesus Christ because Christianity is the religion of peace, the founder of the religion, Lord Jesus Christ. He did not kill anybody. Rather, when... People came to arrest him, and one of his disciples, he pulled up sword and cut ear of the enemy. Jesus told him, put your sword back. Those who die by, those who kill by sword, they will die by sword. And not only that, he took the ear and healed that ear. So, and the, you know what first thing Jesus said in the cross was, did he say, Father, destroy all these people, they are, they have, they have, they are killing me. They spit on my face. What did he say? The first thing he said was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. Why did he say that? Because he has said in his teaching, love your enemy. Pray for them. And he did what he taught. It is not like founder of other religion who say one thing and they do totally the opposite. Jesus is different. What he said, what he taught, he did that. So I will invite one every one of you who do not know peace, who do not have peace in their heart, accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. He is the Prince of Peace and He will grant you peace, eternal assurance of salvation and peace with human beings as well. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Now 25-minute opening statement by Nadir Ahmed. All right. I would like to thank Daniel for that uh, very interesting presentation, how be it, I think a very sanitized version of what the Bible really teaches. Uh, now, you raise a lot of objections against Islam, and I think we have already dealt with that in the past debate. I would ask you, uh, Pastor Scott, and out of fairness for me, please uh, let's keep Islam, you know, these, all these objections out of it, because it's really hard to juggle both in this debate. But let me just go ahead and quickly address some of the things you said. 
somehow you've come to the conclusion that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, didn't have peace with his creator. Did you talk to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, Did you talk to him? No, these are your false interpretations, okay? I can't go to you and say, you don't have peace with your creator. The guy's going to come and say, dude, what are you talking about? Do you know me? You know, why don't you let me explain my, uh, what my relationship with God is? So please, let's not get into all that. Um, you also said that um, Muslims seek peace by fighting for Allah. I, very, I addressed that, uh, you know, inside the last debate. By fighting against Nazi Christianity and defeating Nazi Christianity, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam brought peace to the Middle East because back then the, the, the Christians declared uh, that all the Jews to be exterminated. Uh, you said that somehow God is a deceiver. There's no such thing like that in the Quran. I already addressed that for you in the last debate. Uh, you talked about, um, you know, somehow that, you know, we don't have an assurance of salvation. I've already addressed that in the last debate. All Muslims will go to heaven, okay? Anyone who has even a grain of mustard seed in their heart will enter heaven, according to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the, the insurity which, you are, which, which the people are referring to is on the way up to heaven, you might run into some problems. Like, for example, there's a punishment in the grave. There's going over the bridge over hell, and which maybe you might get lanced or cut on that bridge. So many different situations. We can't get into that in this debate. That's not the topic. Okay, so again, I please ask you to stick with the topic and let's concentrate on Christianity. Okay? In the last debate, we saw that it was proven that Islam clearly condemns terrorism. Islam condemns any use of genocide. And Islam fights for the right for people to uh, believe in the religion which they want. And that's what we read inside chapter 22, verse 40 of the Quran, where it says, had it not been that God raised up this nation, basically, paraphrasing the verse, to, to challenge, you know, to, uh, to challenge the other nations, monasteries, churches, and mosques, where God's name was being revealed, would have all have been torn down. So anyways, when it comes to the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to find is that the Bible takes a very, very different position on all of these issues, okay? Um, now, I don't want to misrepresent what the, what the Christians believe, and let me just apologize in, in advance if you find my presentation to be offensive. You know, I hope you'll entertain it because we entertained a lot of tough questions about Islam, so we're going to raise a lot of tough issues about Christianity. Now, Christians believe that Jesus is God, and therefore, if, if Jesus is God, then he is a God of the Old Testament, as Christians also believe. It's sort of like one in a trinity. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So, I don't want to misrepresent what the Bible teaches, so we will look at some of the actions of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament acting as God. Now, we as Muslims, before I begin you know, uh, my presentation, we as Muslims, we believe in Jesus Christ as well. But we don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible for the reasons which we are about to share with you. Okay? Let's read 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 3. Here, here are, here's what Jesus ordered his born-again followers to do. It says, Now go and smite Amalek. Utterly destroy all that they have. Do not spare them. Kill men, women. Now here's very in, what's very interesting. W children and infants. So Jesus ordered the killing of infants as well. Okay? Joshua chapter 6 verse 21 under the, prop, under the leadership of prophet Joshua. It says over there, And we utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both men, women, young and old. They even went after the little children and killed them. Okay? And there's so many passages like this. If I were here tonight to share all the verses which pertain to genocide and the deliberate killing of innocent civilians as you in the Bible, I would be here all night. So I think that's good enough, uh, just those two passages. So not only does Jesus Christ endorse the use of genocide and mass terror against, against, against civilian populations, but he especially encouraged people to chase after little girls and boys, wrestle them to the floor and stab them to death, in the name of Jesus Christ, as we have read inside these passages, right? Because kids aren't just going to sit there and say, hey, can you please uh, kill me? Uh, no, they're going to they're gonna run like heck, okay? So here we see that the Bible presents a problem, the rogue nation, an, a hostile nation, an aggressive nation, which is steeped in sin. And then the Bible presents a solution on how to handle the rogue nation, and that is mass extermination and genocide. Okay, so now let's deal with some of the uh, 
more, some more objections, which I think um, Pastor Scott was raising. He said that, he said that basically in the Bible, it's talked a lot about peace. And, you know, you should be at peace with your neighbor and stuff like that. Folks, just because you see the word peace in the Bible doesn't mean that you cannot commit genocide as Jesus Christ himself encouraged people to do. Read Psalms chapter 34, verse 14. It says, seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace and pursue it. Now keep reading. We keep going down in the psalm, and then we see Jesus says, Esher, meaning blessing to the ones who take the babies and slam them up against rocks. So Jesus is actually blessing those who take the babies and slam them up against rocks. So just because you see a peaceful verse inside the Bible doesn't mean that, doesn't, uh, that you cannot commit genocide because the book of Psalms talk about peace and then you will see that, uh, that it is also talking about taking people's babies. Jesus encouraged them to slam them up against rocks. Okay? But what's very important to understand is how do you get peace? What is the lesson of the wars which we found that Jesus waged in the Old Testament? This is... Genocide and terrorism is a way in which you bring about peace in the Bible. Okay? And the deliberate killing of innocent civilians. And then we see a verse over here where it says, um, put away your sword. Matthew chapter 26, verse 52, which I believe Daniel uh, Scott uh, quoted. It says, and put away your swords, for all they that take the sword shall perish by the sword. So, Okay, so he says, there you go. You see, we can't use violence anymore. Really? Okay, let's, let's take this verse and, and apply it. We all know this is blatantly false because people have used the sword and they did not perish by the sword, right? We have police officers. We have, um, you know, uh, war veterans who have all used a sword, but they didn't perish by the sword. They, they lived and lived natural lives and died, um, what's it called? Um, Deaths which were, which, were, which were normal. So then therefore this verse is blatantly false. What about in self-defense? What do you do in self-defense? Well, if a man were to break into your house and try to kill your family, would you, um, would you just basically uh, just sit there on the sofa and watch? No, the Christians are going to fight back. So the Christians are going to say, oh, but the Bible doesn't, the Bible do, it doesn't apply in those situations. You see, so the Christians are going to say it doesn't, you know, apply in those situations. So here we see it's kind of a game which is being played, okay? And the game which is being played here is that, you know, they're only going to apply this verse in certain situations which appeal to their agenda. For example, you know, fighting against Hitler. Does the verse apply over here? You know, um, they're going to say, no, the verse doesn't apply here. What about... Um, Defending your family from an, from an intruder, a man who's coming after your children. Will you use violence to kill that person? I think Daniel Scott will say, yeah, we will use violence to kill that person. Okay, so the verse doesn't apply over here. What about fighting people at the point of a knife and um, if they don't accept Christ, then you kill them? Oh, yeah, well, see, Jesus says, all those that use a sword shall die by the sword. So what we see here is that they're basically cherry-picking when they want to use this verse and when they don't want to use this verse. If it doesn't suit their agenda, then they're not going to use a verse, okay? If it suits their agenda, then they're going to say, oh, you know what? Jesus said that all those that use the sword shall die by the sword. So we can't cherry pick over here, all right? Either you make this verse applicable to all situations or you leave it where into the exact context it was referring to, meaning it's only specific to the context in which it was revealed. For example, if we look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 52, if you look at the context over there, the, the um, what's it called? The, the Christians were outnumbered by the Romans. Okay, and then Jesus, and then yes, in that specific situation, if they would have used a sword, they would have all died by the sword. In that specific situation. So the verse there is only specific to that situation. But if you want to take it out of the context and say it refers to all situations, all right, that's no problem. We can go that route. But 
that would make the Bible blatantly false because remember it said all they that use the sword shall perish by the sword. And we know that's not true. All right, we know that's not true of uh, Pastor Scott, all right? Okay, so anyways. <clears throat> so it's just a matter of being honest and consistent. If you are going to make this verse apply to all situations, then let's do it. You just cannot cherry pick and you look at all of the situations that deal with using violence and say, oh, you know, the, it's referring to this situation over here, but it's not referring to this situation over here because I don't like that. Okay, we cannot cherry pick. So really a big job of mine tonight is to keep Daniel Scott honest with Scripture. I'm going to be on the lookout for any kind of cherry-picking game. And um, now, of course, when I leave, then you can cherry-pick all you want. But, <laughs> you know, it's not going to be on my shift. Okay? So you just can't say, I like the verse to apply over here, but I don't like it to apply over here. Okay? Because it doesn't suit my agenda. <sighs> Let's look at this other verse. Jesus says, love your enemy. Same situation, same response. They're going to cherry pick when they want to love their enemy and when they don't. Okay, you love your enemy? Do you love Satan? Do you love Satan, Daniel Scott? Okay, yeah, he's an enemy. All right. He doesn't love Satan. And the Bible says love your enemy. So what he's saying here, okay, in that situation, in that situation we don't love our enemies. All right, no problem. Uh, I have, and what about Adolf Hitler? Do you guys love Adolf Hitler? Raise your hand if you are in love with Adolf Hitler. Would you put a big portrait of Adolf Hitler? In fact, it looked very nice in that corner over there. Anyone here loves Adolf Hitler? Okay, good. We're all in agreement. Nobody loves Adolf Hitler. Okay? So please, we cannot cherry pick when we want to use this verse and when we don't. Okay? So my advice to you, if you don't follow this advice, the Bible is going to appear to be absurd nonsensical that is only referring to a specific situation a specific situation and that's the context it's talking about love your enemy if people want to take you to court and they want to sue you and take money from you and you got all this hostile conflict between family and friends love your enemy it's only in that specific context or else you're gonna fall in love with Satan and that's ridiculous that is just plain ridiculous and I know no one here loves Satan okay so, and then he also brought up another point that he said that, <clears throat> that basically God punished nations of people. We don't have any problem with that. God can punish nations of people. He can, God can kill men, women, and children. Yes, because he is God. He is a creator. He is the one who gives life, and he is the one who takes life, okay? We don't have a problem with that. But what we have a problem with is a book which encourages Christians to commit genocide against others. A book which teaches that it is okay to kill children during war. And that's what we have a problem with. Okay? So, okay. Let's, let's deal with some other objections that some people might raise, even though he didn't really raise them um, inside this debate. In fact, I think my... Let's see if I have time for that. Okay, he said basically, well, you know, these other nations of people... They are waging war against Israel. They wanted to fight against them. Yeah, but why is that? Why were the nations, why were these other pagan tribes waging war against Israel? Read Joshua chapter 11, verse 20. For it was Yahweh himself who hardened their hearts to wage war against Israel. Who's Yahweh here? Jesus Christ. Yahweh himself hardened their hearts to wage war against Israel so that he might destroy them totally, exterminating them without mercy. Okay? So that's why they waged war against Israel. So what we see from this passage is that Jesus made them attack the Israelites for no other purpose but to teach his born-again Christians how to hunt and kill for Christ. And that's inside Joshua chapter 11, verse 20. All right? So let's look at another passage over here. 2 Timothy 3.16. It says here that all Scripture is given by inspiration unto God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, and corrections and instructions unto righteousness. So what the Bible here is telling us is that all Scripture is profitable. 
all scripture is profitable, and it has to fall into one of these four categories, okay? Either this is your doctrine, reproof, corrections, or instructions unto righteousness. So in these criteria which we are given in 2 Timothy, the question which I have for Pastor Scott, <clears throat> where does hunting down children and killing them in the name of Jesus and committing genocide, which one of these categories does it fit in in 2 Timothy 3.16? And we look forward to hearing his answer. Okay? But the problem with Daniel Scott, um, and I think with a lot of Christians today, is that they forget that that the Bible is a book of guidance for your daily lives, okay? It's kind of like a reference guide which provides uh, solutions for life's issues. For example, you know, people turn to the Bible to seek guidance on almost every aspect of their life, everywhere from marriage, worship, relationships, and parenting. Let's look at some passages in the Bible. It says over here inside Proverbs chapter 27 verse 9, 27 verse 9, the pleasantness of having a friend springs from his earnest counsel. A good friend is going to give you honest advice. Do not forsake your friend. Christians have no problem of benefiting from the wisdom of the Bible when it comes to this passage. But when it comes to the passages in which Jesus offers a solution on how to handle the rogue nation, which is complete genocide, then all of a sudden the Bible metamorphosizes into a meaningless, worthless book of history. And then once, the, once they pass over that passage, then the Bible is restored back to a manual on life which benefits thousands of people or millions of people. Okay, so why do we have this double standard? So this is another example of cherry-picking from the Bible, you know. So we cannot have this type of double standard. We have to be honest and consistent with our use of the Bible. Therefore, if we were to view the Bible as a reference guide on life, that means when it comes to issues and topics such as what are the rules of warfare? You should go to the Bible and take a look. Can we carpet, bomb, and kill innocent civilians? Can, how to deal with your enemies? We should go to your reference guide and see how to handle these types of problems and see what are the solutions offered by the Bible to these problems, okay? And when we do that, here are the answers that we find. That the Bible demonstrates how wars should be fought and won. Jesus Christ recommended the Christians to commit genocide against the enemies and also fully endorses the mass killing of innocent civilians, and that includes, um, and, and that includes children, and that these are legitimate tactics of war according to the Bible. Okay, so having said that, I would like to answer my question, which I don't think he was able to answer in his first pre uh, uh, you know, opening presentation, is my question to him is, what is wrong to benefit from the wisdom of the Bible on tactics of war, rules of war, during engagement? Why is that wrong, Pastor Scott? Why can we benefit from the wisdom of the Bible on this? And we look forward for, to him to uh, answer those questions. Let's move on now to the Luke mandate. This is a very important passage. Luke 19.27, if you guys have a Bible, you could, you, could, you could flip open there. One of the purposes which I have here tonight is to expel certain myths which surround the Bible. One of the greatest myths is that somehow the Bible guarantees and, 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 and acknowledges people's right to choose whatever religion they want. This is not true. There's nothing in the Bible which says that people have the right to choose whatever religion they want. That's only found in Islam. Surah 18, verse 29, chapter 2, verse 256, Surah 108, and so many other passages. Okay, so this is not true. This is a big hoax. Religious freedom is unbiblical. All right? This is not what the Bible teaches. Rather, the Bible teaches the opposite. Let's start from 2 Chronicles, chapter 15, verse 13. It says over there that for whoever would not seek the Lord, whether young or old, were killed, were put to the sword. So here we see that even little kids, if they would not seek the Lord, who is the Lord? Lord Jesus Christ. Because they're one in a trinity, remember? 
if you would not seek the Lord, they would be put to death. I just can't imagine this. You've got these little kids in front of you, and you brandish a knife in front of them. Will you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And you're going to kill them if they say no. <sighs> Let's look at another verse. And this verse right over here, you know, we're just going to let it read for itself. Luke 19.27. It says, But those of mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring them hither and slay them before me. Okay, so... I'm not going to put my own interpretation in this. I'm not going to put my own spin on this. Let's read the verse again. It's very clear. But these are Jesus' words. But those of mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring them hither and slay them before me. Okay, so that's very clear. Now the immediate knee-jerk reaction of the Christian is, oh, but you're taking that verse out of context. It's out of context. Okay, let's go to the context. And when we look at this verse in context, what we see is that Jesus presents himself as a king, okay? He gives a certain, certain amount of money to his followers, and he, then he wants, and then he goes away, and then upon return, he wants that money to grow. So if he gave you 10 bucks, when he comes back, he's going to give you $20 here. The money here represents the gospel, Right? And, the follow, and, of course, the growth on the money is the growth of the church or bringing people to the gospel. Okay? And you'll find that inside several Bible commentaries. So one guy comes up to Jesus and he gives his original 10 bucks back. He had no growth on the money. And then Jesus becomes mad. And then he offers Luke 19.27 as a solution to the problem on how he could grow the money. Do you get that? So Luke 19.27 is, an answer, is a solution to, the prob to his problem. So this is an advice on how to grow the church. Bring them hither, and if they don't accept me as Lord, slay them before me. So you have to, you have to admire the Bible's pro uh, problem-solving abilities. And I will readily admit, if you follow that advice, when Jesus returns, you're going to have a lot, of, a lot of growth, a lot of profit. So that is actually good advice, okay? So from this passage, we see here that um, the Bible strongly advocates uh, forced conversion in several places, okay? And um, one thing I want to, uh, what I presented to you on Luke 19.27 is a clear, concise exegesis of the Bible without any kind of exaggeration. Exegesis, I mean a critical explanation of the Bible, my challenge for the Christians, not only for Daniel Scott, but for everybody, I challenge you to show me any error in my explanation of Luke 19.27. And if you are not able to show any kind of error in what I have presented to you, then that is a clear explanation of the Bible. It is a legitimate, honest explanation of the Bible. Okay, so this is a very, very big difference between Islam and Christianity. We've already debated Islam. Let's not debate it again. If you want to debate Islam again with me, we can do that. But let's save this debate to focus on the Bible. GTTF. Remember this an acronym. GTTF. G stands for genocide. T stands for terrorism. The other T stands for targeting children in warfare. And F stands for forced conversion. The Quran condemns GTTF. But we see here that the Bible presents a very, very different opinion on this. The Bible fully endorses GTTF in both 2 Timothy 3.16 in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. Okay? We also went over the cherry-picking game. It's very important that if we're going to use verses like, you know, Jesus says, all they that use the sword shall perish by the sword, fine. Do not just cherry-pick which situations you want to apply that verse and which situations you don't. Okay, and that is the difference between Islam and Christianity. Um, so I have a few more seconds over here, and um, I guess I'll just go ahead and Thanks, give them Mike. a yeah. Ned, your time's up. Thank you guys for uh, presenting your 25-minute opening statements. We're going to take a short break, and then we'll have time for 10-minute rebuttals on both sides.